Praise God. Let's open to 1 Corinthians 12, 31. What a privilege to minister to this great assembly. Uh, what an honor uh, to uh, finish off the morning on Thursday, Thursday the day of the international uh, endeavors. I am so happy to be in, in the United States. Uh, after the, my last international trip was March last year, and some people are asking me how I got away. Well, you have to... You have to have connections in high places, and uh, I've been talking to KGB for so many years. <laughs> they can get me out. They can do everything. Uh, not really. I uh, am so uh, thankful uh, for this opportunity. You know, we, we, we lost two giants uh, last year. Uh, one of them was uh, a founder of our fellowship. Uh, beloved by everybody here in this place, Pastor Wayman Mitchell. And the other one was uh, Pastor Glenn Cluck. Uh, he had a major influence on my life. He was my hero. If it was about supernatural, I knew whom I should speak with, whom to consult, whom to ask questions. I got to spend some time with him in different parts of the world always excited, amazed by the stories. You know, he pushed my mind into supernatural. He pushed my faith into supernatural. He would say things that I've never heard from anybody else. He had a gift, and he was sold out to see the Holy Ghost power on this planet. So as a tribute to him, I don't know how it happened, but it's, it wasn't planned, but as a tribute, to him, let me preach on a more excellent way this morning. First Corinthians 12, 31, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. A few years back, Pastor Campbell came to do our conference, and uh, as you might know, he loves antiques. So we went to this one store. Now, I don't understand anything about antiques. I, I think I'm too young for that. <laughs> and so we went in there. There was a, a Richard Romero and uh, Ron Meyer with us. Uh, we were looking, you know, I was looking through the old junk <laughs> without much interest. You know, Pastor Campbell was not, not impressed either. He said to me, he came up to me, said it's this old Chinese forgeries of no value. And then he, he asked me to translate these words to the owner of the store. Um, uh, if the store owner, if you are a real expert of antiques, then you must have something better than this. And the owner's countenance lit up. He said, I see a real connoisseur of art. And he invited us to follow him to his house. When we got to uh, the door, this man uh, turned off the alarm in his house with a phone call. We went inside, and I immediately understood everything. It was an enlightening moment. The real treasures were hidden inside. Icons hung on the walls of such a value that our heads started to spin because of demons Pastor Campbell said, these uh, cost a fortune. And then it was interesting, we went through the whole house into the patio. There was a secret hatch in the floor of that patio. He, it opened access to the stairs of the dungeon. I will never forget this feeling. I was like Aladdin descending into a cage with untold treasures. Pastor Campbell got all excited, all the men with us got all excited. You see, he knew something that I didn't know, because there is always something better, some, something superb, something more excellent. I have to add this, that the store owner was very grateful for the purchases made by these men. He's so grateful he offered me 20% next time when, when we, you know... Like, well, the problem was that he was sent to jail for 10 years almost immediately after this accident, so I never got any 20%. <laughs> when we look at our text, we see something very powerful. This is Apostle Paul speaking, and he actually promises to the Corinthian church, if they desire the best gifts, he said, I will show you 
a more excellent way. And I want to preach uh, on more excellent way this morning. See, let's define what is this this morning. See, we have a wrongful idea. Some have suggested that by best gifts and more excellent way, Paul actually meant love or charity discussed in the next chapter, chapter 13. They say that Paul teaches us that charity is a better way than the way of the gifts. They say to us this morning that Paul never, uh, that Paul was talking about this and that was the, he was emphasizing this. But the, re the reality is Paul never intended 1 Corinthians 13 to stand alone as a beautiful piece of prose about love. He did not write it to be framed in flowers to hang on a wall. In fact, he didn't have marriage in mind at all when he wrote 1 Corinthians 13. Rather, it's the center of Paul's teaching concerning spiritual gifts to provide perspective. His idea was that he was not teaching love in place of gifts, but gifts operated with and through somebody who has compassion. What is then a more excellent way he's talking about? The word excellent in Greek is the word hyperbole. This, very, this is very emphatic term. And it means superlatively or beyond measure. So basically what Paul is promising in this text, he says, I will show you something. I will show you a more excellent way, a better way. And, and this is what he's talking about, connected to the gifts. And it makes a big difference, believe me. It's the difference between traveling by car opposed to riding on a horse. It's the difference of crossing the oceans by plane opposed to going by a ship. It is the difference of driving on a highway, high-speed highway, opposed to driving on a bumpy, dirty road. It's the difference of ministry with the gifts of the Holy Ghost opposed to ministry without it. For those of us that are looking for a better way on the internet, you're looking in the wrong place. It's the gifts of the Holy Spirit, church. That is what Paul is talking about. He said, if you desire the best gifts, I will show you a much better way. And I submit to you this morning that this is exactly what Paul has in mind. All the possibilities of what can happen in our lives and ministries if we find a more excellent way, the way of the gifts. What is possible? Some people don't even know it. But look through the book of Acts and single out the work of the Holy Ghost and you will see how the church explodes in growth after the initial baptism of the Holy Ghost. You will see how Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Ghost and dropped dead. How the first church appointed deacons and the requirement for those deacons was to be feel full of the Spirit. How Stephen, one of those, is so filled with the Spirit that he, they cannot resist his wisdom and his power. How Philip, the other one, is so filled with the Spirit that he is seeing a mighty revival pour out on Samaria. How the Holy Ghost commands him to go by a desert road. And he went not knowing where he went. How he's taken up church and supernaturally transported to another city after the miracle of salvation of Ethiopian eunuch. How God's agent Ananias, or Ananias rather, comes in and lays hand on Saul and he's filled with the Holy Ghost going and becoming one of the greatest missionaries and pastors of all age. How Cornelius' supernatural salvation is orchestrated through the man that would not touch anything unclean. How the revival breaks out and the Spirit falls on those that are listening, all those that are assembled. And Peter later on, when he talks to Jerusalem, in Jerusalem to the apostles, he says, when I saw the Holy Ghost fall on them, it was like on us in the beginning. How the Holy Ghost teaches them, directs them in, book, in the book of Acts separates Paul and Silas unto the meat. It's an ending church. It is the more excellent way. It is great manual for everybody who is pioneering in this place. A missionary. This is the more excellent way. 
When you, when you read this, you start to wonder, perhaps they knew something that we've never tasted. I can, I can submit to you, we are making disciples that have never tasted what I've just listed. And th this is the danger that we are going to be facing in the years to come. Because these are going to be turbulent, tri uh, turbulent years. And they will, these people and these nations and the world will need people that are full of the Spirit. And they know what it is to travel in a more excellent way. Let me give you a few examples of a more excellent way. I'll share a testimony here. Her name is Olia. Good afternoon, Pastor. I, have, I, I hasten to share with you my testimony about how God miraculously healed me yesterday. I watched uh, the vlog, the sermon on YouTube called Words of Your Future. And there were testimonies of healing and how God gave a child to a married couple. This sermon touched me very deeply. When there was an altar, I asked God for forgiveness for the words of unbelief. Then you begin to pray for healing. There was a, uh, there's a, a little prehistory here. I had a hernia on my stomach about the, about, above the navel. Uh, for 1.5 years, and I, I had to leave my even have to, had to leave my last place of work because of a constant pain and poor health. My husband and I, of course, prayed, and my pastor prayed for me, but the pain did not subside. I agreed to a surgery, but due to the poor test results, the operation had to be canceled. I just had to pray and trust the Lord. And yesterday, when you started praying for healing. As always, I as always put my hand on my stomach and begin to pray with you. And on the phone screen, I heard you start saying that you see a stomach just about the navel there is a tumor. Maybe it's a hernia. And I realized that this was me. It was about me. And I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. And while we were praying, the tumor began to shrink I was so happy, but I didn't tell anybody for another day, constantly checking upon myself, trying to find it, bless her heart. But it disappeared, thank God. This is a more excellent way. This girl is 2,000 kilometers away. She's watching this online. She's not watching an online sermon. She's watching something that was already, you know, preached a day before. And she gets touched by the Holy Ghost. And an amazing miracle transpires. Another testimony. Good evening, Pastor Golbev. I'm a, a Catherine, a sister from the church. She names, she names Customize the Church. I'd like to testify about my healing and the glorify God. Six months ago, I developed a growth on my left wrist. The doctor said that it is a cyst, they, cannot, they can remove it surgically or can pump it out uh, with a laser, but it, it, in either case, there was no, he was no giving me no guarantee that the cyst would not reoccur in the same place. My husband and I decided that we would believe God and pray for healing. I went out to pray for healing in the church service. Pastor prayed for me, laying hands, but the cyst didn't go away. In October, we visited my mother, and she saw the cyst became larger, and she asked me, why didn't I remove it? Oh, it's so difficult to, to speak among unbelieving relatives that I believed God for a miracle. And when, when we returned home, I asked my husband what to do, go to the surgeon to make an appointment for an operation or believe on we decided to make an appointment, and of course, we decided to continue to pray. This Tuesday, I was watching one of your last sermons, and at the end, you offered to pray for the healing and added, you can also pray for healing at your screens. I took this as a personal challenge to prayer. I, led, I, I laid my hand uh, on that cyst. I prayed, and I looked, and nothing happened. But the next morning, however, when I woke up, stroking the place of the cyst, I saw that there was nothing there. The hand was completely healed. And there is a, a picture there that will, uh, uh, that will show you that, that that couple and the cyst, if you can look closely by the wristwatch there, and that's her hand right after prayer in the morning, and it was gone, and it's not there anymore. Okay, third testimony. Um, her name is Marina. 
Hello, Pastor. She's a girl from my church. I had several small lamp, uh, 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 um, small uh, uh, lumps in my mammary glands since 2014. The last time I did a check, uh, it was uh, November 2019. It showed seven cysts. Not so long ago, you offered to pray with everyone who had some kind of tumor, cysts, lumps, etc. And of course, I also prayed. And now, after an ultrasound scan on November 28, 2020, there is not a single one of those. They're all gone. The doctor looked for a long time and said, I can't find anything. I don't see anything. I praise God for this. Let's give God glory right now. Father, we thank you, Jesus. I glorify your name and I exalt thee. Praise your name. So there are three questions when we think about the subject at hand. Do we have the right to expect the Holy Spirit move in our lives as in the book of Acts? Answer this to yourself. If yes, why don't we expect it? If we do expect it, why don't we see it? That's a searching question, and we have to be very careful. See, we call ourselves Pentecostal, but we need to be very careful. We can have the form, but not the substance. We can have the creed, but not the reality. We can talk about Him without the reality of ever experiencing His power. See, that's why I'm worried about the kids raised up in my church, in our churches, that they will be the victims of this. See, I was raised up in a revival. When I got saved, a revival was taking place. Things were operating by the Holy Ghost Church. We saw demon-possessed delivered. We saw manifestations of every kind. When the evangelist would come, we would do some extra repenting because uh, we were afraid the words of knowledge were frightening to us. Listen, I contribute my salvation and my speedy discipleship process to the reality of His presence. The Holy Ghost was there. But our kids' church, they grow in church in Christian homes where people once received and experienced, but now running on inertia of their previous experience and old revelations. I love your stories, but you got to get some new ones. I love your stories from 40 years, years ago, but I mean, God help us, we got to get some new ones. And that's what the problem is. They grow up in such an atmosphere, and it's lost its life and power. And you know what? This happens to the disciples in our churches as well. Our spiritual children, they will breed, this will breed a, a new and weird generation of pastors and disciples that have never known, I'm afraid, have never experienced a more excellent way. I was listening to Pastor, Me Pastor Warner referring to their trip uh, years ago when the fellowship was just starting, uh, their trip with Pastor Mitchell to the Angelus Temple in uh, L.A., into the Bible school. And those were, that were gathered there, when they heard their testimonies, Pastor Warner said, they said this thing, they said, we are studying this in school, but you are living it. And God help us. If years later, we will start saying the same thing. We're studying this in the books. But somebody else, somebody else, not you, not me, somebody else is leaving the book of Acts. See, there's a frightening test that I asked my church about uh, to take. I said to them, listen, suppose, just suppose if one day he is not here. Will we even notice his absence? Now, the other question is, how do you know that he is here? I asked my church, I said, well, what signs do you know that he's present in our midst? Actually, I did a whole a Sunday school series called The More Excellent Way. And I asked these people in the opening of the, uh, of the series, I said, tell me right now, church, why do you believe that he's here? That the Holy Spirit is present. You know, I got so vexed with their answers. They would say, because we, we experience love. Oh, God help us. Because I have the goosebumps when the worship service. God have mercy on us. 
And, and, and these answers like this flooded, and I, I'm looking at, this, at these people, and I said to myself, either I, I'm not doing my job right, or these people, the, the concept, you see, that is what the problem with us. See, some people don't even know how to answer this question. That didn't cross their minds. They don't not see the difference between the Holy Ghost filled life and a good moral and decent life. Or we mistake the Holy Ghost presence with a soulish outburst of emotions. And that's what the charismatic world is doing. And now because of that, the, the, the more expensive our equipment gets, the pro more professional our musicians are, the, the, the bigger our buildings are, the more the presence of the Holy Ghost is. Can I submit to you that the Holy Ghost presence is the most powerfully felt in the huts of Cambodia? In the places where they have no money whatsoever and no understanding, but the Holy Ghost falls and they see miracles that we would salivate over to see in our churches. See, it's a frightening test. And it's frightening to realize that we could be falling asleep and never noticing that. On the 14th of August, 2005, a flight operated by Helios Airlines took off from the island of Cyprus. Shortly after the takeoff, the plane stopped responding to the air traffic controllers in Athens. Two Greek Air Force F-16s fighter jets were scrambled. Their pilots approached the flight, unresponsive flight. They reported that the plane's captain was absent from the cockpit and the co-pilot was slumped over the controls. F-16 pilots reported that they could see oxygen masks hanging from the cabin ceiling and passengers slumped all over and unresponsive. When the pilots flew by the plane a second time, they saw two people apparently trying to take control of the Boeing 737, but it was unclear if they were members of the crew or passengers. What happened into the plane was a loss of cabin pressure. It incapacitated the crew and passengers. All those on board eventually became unconscious as the plane flew on out of pilot for nearly two more hours until it ran out of fuel and crashed, killing all the 115 passengers and six crew members. This incident went into history as a flight that fell asleep. What are the signs of his presence? Just for the record, maybe you don't have an answer to this question. And it's not the feeling of love. <laughs> there are three major signs of the presence of the Holy Ghost Church. And number one is the, sign, it's the conviction of the Holy Ghost. John 16, 8, and when he, came, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And you can believe if you're pioneering, you can claim a more excellent way that people that you are preaching to, that people that receive your flyers or you've testified, witnessed maybe a month or two months ago, will fall under conviction of the Holy Ghost, desiring to look for your church and come into your church. Is this your story? A more excellent way. You know, we have a ministry that is quite successful among the drug addicts. And over and over again, it's very interesting because they come from all over Russia. They come from all over the place. And one thing you hear often, um, more often than not, is uh, when they testify, when they, when they give a testimony, they say, I felt a com compelling, I felt that I needed to go to Vologda. They said, I didn't know why I wanted to go to Vologda. I had no clue uh, why was uh, this uh, desire in my heart that some of them never been to my city. And they said, but I felt this compelling, this desire that I couldn't resist. I need to go to Vologda. And as they would end up in Vologda, somebody would witness to them on the street and tell them about their drug scene, uh, drug rehab place. And they would come to our, the church and get gloriously saved. Conviction of the Holy Ghost. 
You should have this. This is a more excellent way. A story upon story upon story. How people in our church ended up in our church because they felt at night a choking, somebody choking them and telling them, you need to go the next morning, next Sunday morning. You got to be in that little church. Number two, it's the deliverance. The Bible speaks of the deliverance as the sign of the work of the Holy Ghost. Jesus proclaimed in Nazarene synagogue of Nazareth, he said, Luke 4, 18, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to set at liberty those who are oppressed. It is said of Samson that when the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, the robes on his arms became like chariot flags and the bindings dropped from his hands. This is, has to be our experience. This is something that you and I, we need to be hoping for, believing God for. This is what I need. How God appointed, anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Acts 10.38 here, with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are in operation is another one, number three, that has to be active through your pastoral ministry, and you have to desire a more excellent way. See, this is exactly what we need, church. And what is the answer? How do we get this? How do we get there in our lives? Well, the answer is by the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, 31. He says, boil. He said, you have to boil. In my initial text, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. This word desire Earnestly desire, it's a very interesting word. This word is, uh, 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 when it's spoken, it sounded like an imitation of a natural sound of boiling water. And it meant to bubble over because it's so hot, to burn with zeal, to be deeply committed to something with the implication of accompanying desire, to be earnest, to set one's heart on, to be completely intent upon something. Desire spiritual gifts. Romans 12, 11, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. 1 Corinthians 4, 1, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. See, we have to learn. This is a process. Samuel, he didn't know the voice of God. So he's a mentor at that time, a, prophet, a high priest, Eli. He said, listen, you need to stand up after you hear his voice again, and you have to say, I am here, your servant is listening. You have to desire, but you have to also learn. It's the process. John 14, 26, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. You have to go through the learning process. And don't say to me, well, I don't have any spiritual gifts. As if you're a pastor and then they lay hands on you, you are supposed to be operating in one or other gift of the Spirit and maybe more. And God bless you if you have more. But the Bible says we all need to be moving into a more excellent way, a highway instead of a, a dirty, bumpy road. Aren't you tired of a dirty, bumpy road? Aren't you tired of, uh, you know, going on a horse, driving a little horse instead of uh, traveling with a slide or a speed light? We have to understand that there is, it's a learning process. We have to make room in our mind for the words of healing and the words of knowledge. It's a learning process. 
I've been pushing myself since I met uh, and was impressed with uh, Pastor Glenn Clark's ministry. I came up to him. I was uh, uh, g- g- grabbing, grasping every word uh, that would, uh, he would say. I, I, he, t- he told me he has books he can send to me. And you know what? Out of Guam, he sent to Russia a whole pile of books and uh, 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 CDs of uh, preachers like A. A. Allen and uh, uh, Jack Cole and many, many others. And he told me what to read. And I, I was uh, uh, embracing uh, his spirit and asking God, God, move what this man is talking about, what he saw in his life. I pray that you would do this for me. And, uh, but you have to set your heart on and you have to go through this learning experience. And it's not always easy. You can fall flat. You can make a mistake. You can uh, totally humiliate yourself. But, you know, if you have an ego, you can't really be an unsuccessful pastor anyway. It's a learning process. But you have to make room in your mind every sermon, every time you preach. At the end of every uh, uh, service, you can have a time when people are praying at the altar. And it would do good if you would just walk around on the stage and ask him right there and then, God, I pray you minister to my church through your supernatural gifts and give a word of healing or give the word of knowledge. Do something. We have to expect God to show up. I was uh, in Fiji uh, preaching a conference there. such a privilege for Pastor John Perry, missionary of all missionaries. And um, as we were concluding the conference, uh, we were praying for these couples that were sent out. And uh, we were praying for this one couple. Now, I, I, my English is not my first language. So, uh, and, and there are other men praying for these couples. And I, I, had to, I thought I had a word for this couple. And I thought uh, maybe I should say this, but then this couple, particular couple, received one word, then another preacher spoke for some time. And I didn't feel like uh, I need to do this a third time and, and I let the crowd wait. So I, I had this word for them, and it was a funny word. I, it, it's, it meant to prepare for children. And I thought maybe this had to do with spiritual children that are coming into their ministry. Like I said, I didn't say it because this was, you know, not a momentum, I thought. So later on that very same night, John Pastor Perry, he organized all this uh, gathering in his, uh, in his house. And I, I was also there. We had a beautiful dinner. And I saw that couple there and I came up to them and I said, listen, uh, for the life of me, I don't understand this, but I had this word for you. And uh, this is how it went. I said, prepare for children. This girl broke in tears. It turns out they are married for some years and they, haven't, they can't have children. So right there and then, I, uh, in the, the room, uh, Pastor Perry's house, we prayed for them. I, I told them what I felt. But I didn't think this was enough because I, I, I believe that the Holy Ghost needs to get all the glory. So the next Sunday, uh, it was, I was lucky. I was preaching still in that church after the conference, and that couple was still there. So in front of the whole church, Fijian church in Suva, Fiji, I said, this is what I had for this couple, and this is the word that I give them. I, and I know that they haven't had kids, and they were trying to get kids for a while. And I, I told the entire church, I said, I, I, I place myself before you. As a, as a record, that this is what God is telling this couple, prepare for children. Ten months later, John Perry sent me a report. He said, I thought I'd let you know that the young couple pastoring the church in Lami, Kalikana, had a baby girl yesterday. And uh, I want to show that wonderful couple here on the screen. Abdul and Jenny named their beautiful girl Avaiki. This was the young couple you felt compelled to tell God was going to give them a baby. They'd been married for four years at that time, and, uh, uh, and uh, they were trying to have kids all this time. And don't you believe this? God didn't only give them a ministry, but he also gave them a beautiful daughter. Listen, listen, I want to finish, but you know how Jesus says in John 14 and 18, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. 
You know, the context is, is not his second coming. The context of that text is, is his promise of the Holy Spirit. And, and listen, every pastor, every pastor's wife here in this place, you're pioneering. Listen, God said, you know, I don't know what, I don't want to be emotional, but when Pastor Mitchell passed away, And, and I know we have great men, and Pastor Greg Mitchell took over, and, and, I, and I'm believing God for a greater, greater future for our fellowship. But are we orphans? There's a little feel there. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And he, pro- and ma- he meant his presence, the Holy Spirit presence in our ministry, in our lives, in our churches, a more excellent way. We had a privilege, what is it, 13 years ago, of adopting a little boy of three and a half years of age. He grew up to be a tremendous man of God, and I'm believing for the future of this young guy. And uh, through the procedure, you go, you go into a room in an orphanage. They want to show you the child. And I'll never forget this. When I opened the door, when this lady opened the door for us into this little room, they were little kids, three and a half years of age, two and a half, three years of age, little boys, little girls, little, little things, tiny little things. And when the door was open, and we we, we were looking through the door, my wife and I and and this uh, worker of the orphanage, all of their little heads turned, and you could feel the expectation they, they were looking closely. Who are these people? Is it my mama? Is it my papa? They're coming to pick me up from this place and all these little eyes and all these little heads, they were turning and they're watching us from the distance. I mean, I felt like I wanted to take all of them at once, you know, but we only got one. But listen, listen, you are not an orphan. Pioneering your church, going through the green, green grind, fighting and struggling for every soul. God, Jesus said, the promise of God, you're not an orphan. Pastor's wife, you're not an orphan. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to leave you like this. You're not going to be moving in the dark. I have come and I will claim you as my child and I am going to pour your, my spirit into your life and into your ministry and your prayer should be, church. God, you promise that you are not going to leave me in this place, that you are going to pick me up, that you are going to pour your fatherly love into my soul and my heart and you're going to bless me and you're going to multiply me and you're going to show me a more excellent way, the way of the Spirit of God, church. So I guess the push of my sermon is for you and I to further our, our search for the supernatural in our ministries, to allow God to be God, to allow Him to move through our midst, Because these people will be blessed beyond measure. You'll see miracle upon miracle of healing and restoration. And when you see this, it will energize your ministry. It will bring revival into your church. And people will be expectant. And they will know that there is a God in heaven. Not just the logic, persuasive words of human wisdom. That's what I believe, church. That's what I long for in my heart. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for just a second.